On the 28th of June, 1914, a man and his wife were murdered in Sarajevo, Bosnia. As their car stopped at this intersection, an assassin shot them both at close range. It was just two shots, yet they sparked a global war. One of the bloodiest and most destructive in history, the First World War. At least 25 million people died on battlefields from the Arctic Circle to Zambia. Millions more lives were lost in the disease, the dislocation, and the civil wars that it unleashed. The map of the world was completely redrawn as some of the world's mightiest empires collapsed. It was a war that shaped everything that was to come after that. Without the First World War, there would very likely have been no Great Depression and no World War II. No Mussolini, no Hitler, no Stalin, no Mao Zedong as we know them today. So why was the world plunged into gigantic conflict? What were the real causes of World War I? I'll show you. First things first, this was a world of empires and they saw themselves as being locked in competition. Europeans ruled over 84% of the Earth's surface. The biggest empire in the world was the British, stretching from Canada through the Caribbean, much of Africa and large swathes of South Asia into Australasia. Britain also dominated the world's oceans with the largest and most powerful navy on Earth. The French controlled big chunks of Africa and Asia. The Russians ruled from Finland to the Pacific and America had extended its frontiers across the continent and beyond. The Middle East was ruled by the Ottoman Turks. Much of Central and Eastern Europe was controlled by the Austro-Hungarians. And then we have the newest empire on the scene, the Germans. Germany had only been a unified country for less than 50 years, but it had exploded onto the world's stage in that short lifespan. It had one of the world's biggest economies, and amassed the third largest global empire after Britain and France. So, and this is a big underlying reason for the First World War, this was a world where conquest, competition, seizing territory, defeating your rivals was an accepted part of life. From 1899 to 1902, the British had fought a major war in Southern Africa to conquer the Boer Republics. The Germans had imposed their rule on Namibia between 1904 and 1908. In 1911, the Italians had invaded Libya, part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Greece, Serbia and its allies had also attacked the Ottoman Turks in 1912 and 13 and captured much of the Turkish territory in the Balkans. War wasn't something unfortunate, a last resort, but something that was inevitable and could even be positive. Not only could empires amass more territory and resources overseas, but war might serve a purpose at home too. Across Europe, new ideas were on the march. Many people were calling for political rights, for democracy, for socialism, for the breakup of empires. And there was this very dangerous sort of application of Darwinian ideas to human societies. And social Darwinism believed or argued that the human race could be divided up into species. And in their natural state, species tended to have natural predators, tended to struggle for survival. And these ideas were applied to societies. And so there was an idea that the French were the hereditary enemies of the Germans, and the Germans were the hereditary enemies of the French and of the Russians. Now, these are dangerous ideas, because then you begin to think, well, war is bound to happen. And also that whole notion, that, that, that phrase, the struggle for survival, acquires a moral connotation. If you don't struggle for survival as a people, you don't deserve to survive. What's wrong with you? you know, you're, you're weak, you're feeble. These ideas were deeply dangerous to those in charge. Insecure leaders thought that war might bolster their rule by ramping up patriotic rhetoric, celebrating the military, emphasizing traditional military values rather than new democratic ones. The old elites hoped to cling to power. Kings and emperors and their children were shown in military uniforms. Fictional bestsellers imagined the next war. Soldiers wielded enormous political influence. A lot of these rulers thought that war could be an opportunity. If we get a good war, it'll bring the nation together. 
We won't have all these internal divisions, which you know, we do have. We have different political divisions, different classes, different ethnicities, and it will. So some of them thought, they certainly thought in Germany, in certain circles around the Kaiser, it will give us the excuse to suspend the Constitution, get rid of the Reichstag, which we don't like, um, close down the unions who, who are troublesome, get rid of the Social Democratic Party. We can go back to some sort of idealized past where you, know, you ruled with an iron fist and the lower classes knew their places. So it's a complex, I think, of ideas and emotions. So it was a world where war was an accepted part of life. And if you believed that war was going to happen anyway, then it made sense to strike first when you were ready and your potential enemy was not. German leaders, for example, were sure that they were going to fight their neighbours Russia sooner or later. One senior German civil servant wrote in 1914, we were reconciled to the fact that we would have war with Russia. If the war had not come now, we'd have had it in two years' time under worse conditions. In 1912, at a meeting of the very top German political and military officials, Germany's senior general said, war, the sooner the better. So, the great powers thought that war was coming and they wanted to win it. They invested vast amounts of money in creating better weapon systems, better railway networks, ships and defences. And if your neighbour's doing that, well, you should too. The result? A massive arms race. The size of Europe's armies and navies grew and grew. There comes a point, though, when you can't expand your forces anymore. You run out of men. You run out of money. You need allies. So as the power and size of their neighbours' armies increased, nations sought allies to help out if and when war came. France and Russia were both neighbours of Germany. Russia to the east, France to the west. Worried about the strength of Germany, they formed an alliance. They agreed that if Germany attacked one of them, the other would come instantly to their aid. That meant Germany worried about being squeezed between the two of them and looked for support to its neighbour, Austria-Hungary. They formed a close alliance, becoming known as the Central Powers. Britain had hoped to avoid getting involved in a bloody and expensive European war. But Germany was also making the British nervous. Germany's leader, the Kaiser Wilhelm, was the grandson of Britain's Queen Victoria. While visiting his grandma in her favourite palace on the Isle of Wight, he'd watched the naval ships of the British Royal Navy sailing in and out of their main base in Portsmouth. He had dreamed, one day, of building a mighty German navy. And he'd made that dream a reality in the years leading up to 1914. Germany had built a modern, technologically advanced, powerful navy. But that had worried the British. And despite their desire to stay out of European wars, it made Britain much more sympathetic to France and Russia. Britain did not want to see Germany, with its huge navy, dominating Europe even more. So, Europe was separated into massive power blocks, each deeply suspicious of each other, and all of them assuming that there would be a big war sooner or later. A few years earlier, Germany's greatest statesman, Otto von Bismarck, had summed it all up. Europe today is a power keg, and the leaders are like men smoking in an arsenal. A single spark will set off an explosion that will consume us all. And what he said next was spookily accurate. I cannot tell you when that explosion will occur, but I can tell you where. Some damned foolish thing in the Balkans will set it off. So let's have a look at that spark, a damned foolish thing in the Balkans. That man and woman who were assassinated in Sarajevo, deep in the Balkans, that was Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie. He was heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He and his wife were on a visit to Sarajevo, the capital of the empire's Bosnian province. Many Bosnians were ethnically Serbian. They wanted Bosnia to leave the Austro-Hungarian Empire and join their next door neighbour, Serbia. Serbia encouraged these rebels. Serbian officials had supplied a group of assassins with bombs and guns with which to target Franz Ferdinand on his visit. The Archduke's motorcade drove right through the middle of Sarajevo. He'd been advised not to visit, but he insisted. Despite the obvious security risk, the street was not lined with troops. Security was pretty lax. The route 
was lined with would-be assassins. As the Archduke's car drove past the first of them, he failed to act. The second member of the group threw a bomb at Franz Ferdinand's car. It bounced off and blew up, wounding a dozen people. The motorcade sped off to the town hall. The other assassins only glimpsed it as it whizzed past. After a ceremonial event at the town hall, the motorcade headed back through the city. After the drama on the way, there was confusion about which way they should take on the way back. The Archduke's car turned down a side street. An official shouted the driver was going the wrong way. The driver stopped, attempted to reverse, and stalled the car. By extraordinary coincidence, standing on that exact street corner was one of the plotters, Gavrilo Princip. He had almost given up hope, and yet now, here was his target in a stalled, open-top car a couple of metres away from him. He raised his pistol and fired two shots. He couldn't miss. Both the Archduke and his wife Sophie were hit and died within minutes. Franz Ferdinand's murder set off a chain reaction. The Austrian Empire wanted revenge. They were terrified of looking weak. If they did not act, they were worried their empire might break up. They had to take a stand. They knew that Serbia had sent the gun used in the killing. It was just another example of Serbia undermining the Austrian Empire, encouraging its peoples to rebel. And so for Austria-Hungary, Serbia was an existential threat. If Serbia had its way and the South Slavs began to be pulled out, then the Poles in the North would want to leave. The Ruthenians were beginning to develop a national consciousness. They might want to join with, with, with the Russian Empire. The Czechs and the Slovaks were already very, very, well, the Czechs particularly, were already very much demanding more and more power. So Serbia meant to Austria-Hungary the end. Now the Austrians had an excuse to deal with Serbia once and for all. But there was a problem with this. If Austria wanted to invade and punish Serbia, Serbia could call on its ally the giant of the East, Russia. Russia and Serbia saw themselves as part of the same Slavic people. They shared a religion, language was similar. Russian leaders, just like those in Austria, were also terrified of looking weak. If they let their ally, Serbia, get steamrolled, it would make them look impotent on the world stage and encourage their opponents at home. So the Russians made it clear that they would stand by Serbia. So. Austria-Hungary would now have to contend with the huge Russian army if it dealt with Serbia. The Austrians would need help. Before the Austrians did anything, they checked in with their key ally, Germany. The German Kaiser Wilhelm was not a fan of important members of royal families getting killed in the street. He also did not want his Austro-Hungarian allies to get pushed around. Also, the Germans were convinced they'd have to fight the Russians and the French eventually. If it was inevitable, perhaps now was the time. Now, in 1914, things were looking better for Germany than they would in a few years' time, when the Russian army might have upgraded its weapons and its war industries. The Kaiser sent the Austrians a message of support known as the Blank Check. A week after the assassination, on the evening of the 5th of July, Austrian diplomats in Berlin reported back to their masters in the Austro-Hungarian capital, Vienna. The Kaiser had said, if we really saw the necessity for military action against Serbia, he would think it regrettable if we did not take advantage of the present moment, which is favourable from our point of view. Now with German backing, the Austrians felt bold. They issued a tough ultimatum to the Serbs. The Serbs would have to allow Austrian investigators to work inside Serbia to track down anyone who conspired to kill the Archduke. Anti-Austro-Hungarian messaging had to be removed from the press and the education syllabuses. Nationalist groups in Serbia were to be shut down. Reading the ultimatum in London, the British Minister for the Navy, one Winston Churchill, was shocked. The Austrian ultimatum to Serbia, he thought, was one of the most insolent documents of its kind ever devised. Serbia even gave in on most of the points, but not all of them. If you are an independent state, can you accept having the officials of another power monitoring your, your bureaucracy and your legal system? I mean, it, it, it would have been too much. And, and what, what is more, Serbia was given the ultimatum, it was given 48 hours to answer it. 
while the Serbs were desperately trying to come up with an answer, the Austrian, the Austrian embassy in Belgrade was burning its papers. Austria broke off diplomatic relations on the 24th of July and ordered its army to prepare for war. At 11 a.m. on the 28th of July 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. The first shots of the First World War were fired on the Danube by an Austro-Hungarian gunboat. It bombarded the defences of the Serbian capital Belgrade. Russia now had to decide what to do. Its Tsar Nicholas II came under enormous pressure from his generals to order the army to mobilise, that is, to prepare for war. Reluctantly, he agreed and signed the order on the 30th of July. This was a huge moment. In Russia, Nicholas II, you had a man who was weak, who was determined to hang on to the Romanov power, who, who, who saw any concession to the new forces in Russia, the new democratic forces, new constitutional forces as weakness, who had been forced to give a constitution and then had spent the next 10 years trying to, trying to claw back the powers. This is someone who was weak, but who feared that if he didn't look tough in 1914, uh, people would, would stop supporting him. I mean, he, he decided on war, I think, partly because he was afraid of being weak. Germany decided it could not let the Russian army mass on their frontiers, in position to invade and not respond. So on the 1st of August, Kaiser Wilhelm signed the orders for the German army to mobilise, and then ordered champagne to celebrate. Now here's the crazy thing. German mobilisation didn't just mean the army gathered itself ready for war. It meant that the army went to war because it expected to go to war with the Russians and the French, who were their allies, the German war plan was to invade France first, knock their army out, occupy Paris, and then turn with all their strength to deal with the East, the Russians, who would be slower to get going. There was no way the Kaiser could, for example, say, let's gather an army to keep an eye on the Russians, but not strike first. By mobilising, the Kaiser hadn't just told the army to get ready for war, he had sent the German army to war. By 7pm on the 1st of August, the day the Kaiser signed the papers, the German army invaded Luxembourg. The following day, the first German troops marched into France. France had been preparing for a German invasion for decades. On its border with Germany, it had created a vast series of fortifications. The Germans knew that very well. So the German plan was to avoid all that and strike around the flank of the French through Belgium and take them from the north. It was known as the Schlieffen Plan after the strategist who came up with it. On the 4th of August, German troops entered Belgium. But here's the problem. Belgium was neutral. Its security was guaranteed by Great Britain. If Germany invaded Belgium, Britain would be obliged to help. Britain had been confident it could avoid the war. The British Prime Minister Herbert Asquith had written to his girlfriend on the 24th of July, we are within measurable or imaginable distance of a real Armageddon. Happily, there seems to be no reason why we should be anything more than spectators. But now, with German troops invading Belgium, everything changed. Britain felt it should honour its word to Belgium. Also, it didn't want a triumphant Germany controlling Europe with Belgian and French bases very near the English coast for its powerful navy. Britain was also worried that if Russia and France won, they might threaten the British Empire in Asia and elsewhere. Perhaps it was better to get involved and help shape the outcome. The British cabinet spent hours locked in tempestuous discussion. Two cabinet members resigned, but it was decided that the British government would issue an ultimatum to Germany. Get out of Belgium or it's war. On the evening of the 4th of August, the British cabinet sat together in Downing Street, waiting for Big Ben's chimes. At 11 o'clock or midnight Berlin time, the ultimatum ran out. There had been no response from Germany. Reports made it clear that Germany had certainly not stopped its invasion of Belgium. Britain declared war on Germany. I once came across this message sent out by the British Naval High Command at 1am on the 5th of August. Commence hostilities at once against Germany. The great powers of Europe were now at war. But because of their huge global empires, 
That meant the world was at war. Britain had taken its empire to war. Canada, South Africa, Australia, India, and many more colonies. These imperial troops would form some of the most effective units in the British forces. France brought its colonies, Morocco, Algeria, Cameroon. They would play an enormous role in the French armies. They tried to repel the German invaders. Belgium brought its empire as well. Troops from Belgium's enormous territories in the Congo invaded German colonies in Africa. The war might have begun in Europe, but the fighting between these global empires immediately spread all over the world. On the 6th of August, British and German naval ships clashed in the Bahamas. The first shot fired by a British soldier in the war was in West Africa on the 7th of August, when al Haji Grunshi of the British Gold Coast Regiment invaded German-held Togoland. The next few years would see terrible fighting on the so-called Western Front in France and Belgium as the Allies attempted to drive out the German invaders. The static trench warfare became infamous for its enormous casualties, giant offensives and little movement for years on end. The Austro-Hungarians did invade Serbia and suffered a string of defeats at the hands of the smaller country before conquering them with the help of their German allies. The Russians fought the Germans and Austro-Hungarians on the Eastern Front in what is now Ukraine, Poland, Belarus and Moldova. The strain on Russian society would eventually lead to the empire's collapse. There was fighting on the world's oceans, from the coast of Chile to the North Sea. As the war went on, other powers joined the fighting. In late August 1914, Japan agreed to enter the war as an ally of Britain if it could occupy all the German outposts in East Asia. Japan snapped up these German territories, which ignited its ambitions for a larger Chinese empire. Later in 1914, the huge Turkish Empire joined the Germans and Austro-Hungarians, tempted by the offers of captured Russian territory. There would be fighting across the Middle East as the British and French tried to knock Turkey out of the war. Italy joined the Allies in 1915. Likewise, they were promised provinces of the Austro-Hungarian Empire if they joined in. The fighting in the mountains of northern Italy became infamous for its appalling conditions as thousands of men died in avalanches alone. The USA was determined to stay out of it. But in 1917, the Germans were desperate to starve Britain into submission and made the fateful decision to order their submarines to sink any and all ships heading towards British ports. That meant American ships carrying grain, oil and other supplies. The Americans could not stand by as their ships were sunk and their crews killed. In early April 1917, the USA declared war on Germany. The first American troops arrived in France in June, and by May 1918, over one million American troops were in France to help deliver the final blows against the weakening German army. The First World War radically reshaped the course of history, and we're still living with its consequences. The Russian, German, Turkish and Austro-Hungarian empires collapsed. Although they were victorious, Britain and France were weakened. America had become a major military power. The map of Eastern Europe and the Middle East had been completely redrawn. The end of World War I didn't lead to an end in the fighting as civil conflict, revolutions and wars raged on in the years that followed triggered by the dislocation, the rage and the ambitions ignited by the war. The spark that caused the war was the assassination of the Archduke. But the world with its empires, its competition, its arms race, its insecure leaders was a powder keg just waiting to blow. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.